Hey there drone fans, Rick here again from Drone Valley. So with today's clip I want to spend a little bit more time with the Mavic and dive a lot deeper into the technology behind it. Now over the last couple of weeks I've been raving about this drone, I've been recommending it, I've been bragging about it, I told you to get off the fence if you're on the fence and buy the drone. I wouldn't do that if I didn't believe in the core tech and honestly for me to understand this thing well I've got to spend a lot of time with it and really play with it an awful lot and put it through its paces. And ever since I was a little kid, anything that interested me I would tear apart. And sometimes I put it back together, sometimes I didn't. As I got older, I got better at putting stuff back together. But I had to do the same thing with the Mavic because for me, it's a pretty drone. And again, cool doesn't interest me. Functional interests me. So pretty as it is, I got to see what's underneath the hood of this thing to make sure that I'm really getting my money's worth and understand what kind of care and feeding went into the development of this product. So I tore it apart. And I'll be honest with you, at every step, I've discovered things in there that are well beyond first generation technology. So when I talk about this drone being second or third generation technology, I'll give you some examples in a couple of minutes that I hopefully justify that comment. But what I mean by that is that this isn't just a hodgepodge of components thrown together under a pretty skin. A lot of drones you tear them apart and that's exactly what you get. You get a controller card, you get some speed controls, you got motors from, from another company plugged together. It's so simple anymore that you can buy a kit to build a drone out of Legos. Honestly, you get the right controller and the right motors, you could have a rock fly. So for them to put this together with a bunch of disparate components wouldn't have been so impressive. Even though I think it's a cool drone and it flies exceptionally well, I wanted to make sure that it was really engineered well. So what I did was tear it apart. I started by pulling the battery out. There are four screws inside here, a couple more screws underneath you have to pop off, and this top cover peels off. Now what you're looking at is a blow up of the printed circuit board, the top printed circuit board inside there. And if you're looking at it critically, you'll notice immediately that all the solder joints in there are bubble solder joints. They're perfectly spherical solder joints, which is really unusual because most printed circuit boards, if you tear a technology apart, are pretty sloppy and they've got spikes on them. So the wires poke through or the components poke through and there's a point and they solder that point tight. The reason those bubble joints are in there, those solder joints around it like that, is because with all the RF frequencies inside this drone that have to sort of coexist, if I have any single point in a solder joint, that becomes a miniature antenna. So any kind of RF frequency that's floating around in that circuit will find that point and start radiating. And that's interference for the other circuits that are in there. So the fact that they took the time to solder those with such precision to create that globe there, which has no point of reference or point of emission that you're not going to have RF signals broadcasting off of. So that was the first thing that clued me into the fact that they're really serious about building this thing to almost military specifications. The two things that will kill you when you try to shrink a technology, which is essentially what they did, they took the Phantom 4 technology and put it in a smaller footprint, are heat and RF interference. And they've, by eliminating that RF interference from the solder joints, taken a large step forward to make this a clean operating drone. The second thing they did, which I thought was really nice, is you can see the strain relief in there. So they didn't actually have to glue those wires down to the board, but I'm sure the engineers, again, from their design team, looked at it and said, it's going to be up in the air, it's going to be vibrating the whole time. And if we let those wires loose in there, even no one will ever know that they're loose, eventually that moving back and forth of those wires in that solder drone are going to break and the, the drone's going to fail and come down. So they actually took the extra step to glue the wires down to the printed circuit board. Again, had I not peeled this back, no one would know that. They not only did that, but even where the wires lay in the channel, they put glue across those. They could have just left those wires in the channel. They'd have been fine, but they glued those as well. So for me, when I look at that as an engineer, I look at that and think, they're really taking those extra steps that they realize no one's going to know about, but it makes the drone a much more secure and durable drone. So kudos to them for taking those extra steps. In addition to that, um, when I pulled the cover off, on the back section of the cover, I've got a blow up of it here, uh, there's a metal plate. So that metal plate actually is, an, again, an RF shield to keep that GPS and GLONASS that's underneath that hood. Um, from being sort of polluted, if you will, by other signals on the main printed circuit board. So the metal chat, the metal cover actually cuts down on that signal ratio. The other thing they did was add that ferrite um, bead to the thing. It's like a choke. It's that round black thing that's in the end of the wires there. And you see those a lot of times on power supplies for computers and things like that. What that circular ferrite thing does is it actually cuts down on RF frequencies because each one of those wires is a miniature antenna. It's hanging in there, a miniature antenna. If anything starts broadcasting, it's going to pick that up and it's going to transmit those signals and confuse the GPS. So by putting that ferrite choke on there, that acts like a, a dissipating ring, if you will, for all those signals, those stray radiation signals that may pick up on the wires to prevent them from confusing the GPS. 
again, didn't have to do it, made it a lot more secure and a lot more clean by doing that. So adding that was great. You can also see there's strain relief on those wires. No one's going to open this thing up. Those wires are not going to move other than the vibrations of the actual drone. So by, by gluing that down, they're ensuring that this thing's going to fly for a long time and it's going to fly very reliably. All right, the next thing I noticed, which is something else I talked about, is the heat issue. So heat is a problem because when you bring circuit boards closer together, especially if they're radiating frequencies or RF frequencies are out of them, you're going to get interference from that. You're also going to get heat. And heat's a major issue with this copter. One of the reasons I think there are so many flyaways or the ones I've seen are flying away is because of heat. And I'll go through that in a little bit. But down in the bowels of this, in the very front, right underneath this hood assembly, is a miniature fan. And that fan draws air in from the front, buffets it across the printed circuit boards, and comes out these two vents in the back. So with this sitting on the ground, there isn't enough airflow through it to keep the copter cool. So what I would recommend is don't run this thing unless you're going to fly it. So don't start it up, sit it on your lawn, let the propellers run. It's not going to push enough air through there to keep things cool. It's going to get very, very hot. I'm going to be doing another clip to show you exactly how hot it gets. But the two things you really want to be careful of is on the front of this, this globe. I'd mentioned in a previous clip that you could fly with the globe on, but I don't recommend it because right behind the globe, let me pull out the station as well. Right behind the globe, right here, and I've got a blow up of it, is a vent. And that vent sits right in front of that fan. So if that globe's on, that vent's blocked, and it's not going to get proper airflow through the actual drone to cool off those printed circuit boards. So do not fly with that drone, with that globe on the drone. It's going to definitely cause you problems long term. The other concern I have, and this is something I'm hoping the third party accessory companies will come out with, I'm a little surprised these guys didn't pick up on it. But when this thing lands, and you get that prop wash in the front that's going to be kicking up dirt and stuff, that acts like a vacuum cleaner. So it's going to be sucking air in there, and if those particles get dusted up from the ground, they're going to get sucked in there, thrown through that fan, chopped up, and pushed across those printed circuit boards. So if you're flying in rain, or you're flying anywhere near you get some type of conductive dust, or you get any kind of metal that gets back inside there, it's going to screw up the printed circuit board. So what I'm hoping the third parties will come out with is a little filter that can snap in here that you can change on a regular basis, because that'll keep all the small debris from getting back inside that drone. Once it gets inside that drone, I don't know how you clean it out. I think you're, you're done at that point. So just be really, really aware that if you're landing this thing, land it on a clean surface or, or use a takeoff and landing mat like I like to do. That way you've got a clean surface to land on. If you land this thing in sand or dirt or on a parking lot that's got a lot of debris, it's going to get sucked in there and it's going to get pulled through there on top of the printed circuit board. So just be aware of that. The next thing I noticed uh, when I looked at this from an external position was the bottom. And I thought to myself, well, that's really unique. They've really never put metal before in the Phantom Force. They had small bits of metal, but this whole bottom is metal. And that's heavy. But then I looked at it a little closer, and I'm like, those, are, those look like heat fins to me. This could be a heat sink. So sure enough, I had to pull this thing off. And before I pull it off, let me show you what's going on. So I talked before about these ultrasonic son sonar down here that help you sort of know what height you're at and avoid obstacles. You've got two visual positioning sensors here, as well as those ultrasonics in the center. When I pulled this off, um, you can see from the diagram all the different components that have been glued to the bottom end of that heat sink. Now, I had to apply the glue again when I put it back on to make sure that I had good thermal contact. But that was interesting to me because if you think about the drone, the drone is really like a combination of a lot of different technologies. I mean, it really is incredibly complex little machine. It's amazing the thing can fly at all because what you've got going on inside of there is a miniature computer because you've got video processing chips and you've got, you know, a, things for navigation and GPS coordination. You've got filming going on, so I've got to do video processing in there. All that stuff gets really hot on a regular computer. And on top of that, you've got a cell phone in there with all the RF frequencies and the transmissions back and forth and keeping track of where your position is. So combining all those technologies together would have been tricky in a big drone. Putting them together on one board means that board's going to get really, really hot. So it's super critical that that airflow through that drone cools off that board and cools off the top board on there. But that heat sink really helps to dissipate that. The other concern I had was if you're landing this, that's going to be really hot and you're bringing that down on top of maybe dry grass or wet grass. Not a good combination to have a hot heat sink against wet grass. So just be aware of that. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about next would be the battery connections. So inside the nose of this where the battery actually makes connection here, I thought, let me take a look at those really close. And if you look at the diagram, it's interesting that all the, the fins that are sticking up that impact with the battery are not at the same height. I expected them all to be about the same height all the way across. What you see are the four center ones are lower. The next two on the outer are a little higher. And I thought to myself, what's that all about? Like, why would you do that? You could make them all even. Why would you decide that four of them had to be taller than the other ones? 
So I got my multimeter out and I started checking some of the voltages in here and it turns out that the four center ones are your positive, so that's 12 volts there. The ones that are sticking up further are negative, they're ground. So I thought to myself, I get it. Those ground connections, because all the current that's going to be flowing through that battery have to come back through the ground connections, they made those longer so that they had a better contact point with the battery. So I've got a longer surface area that contacts the battery inside, which means if they get tarnished or dirty over time, I can probably survive with three of them, maybe even two of them, because I've got a longer surface of contact area. So really a brilliant move on their part. Again, it goes to the heart of the engineering. For me looking at that thinking, why would I do that? I understand why they did it, so it's a good thing. Um, I did measure the battery, and I, the nerd in me wouldn't let me not put a diagram up. So there are the voltages. I found that the four internals are all the 12 volt, roughly 12 volt connections. The next two are the grounds. So there's there's four in the center that are 12 volt positive. There's two sets of grounds on either side, and then there's extra connections outside there. And I got kind of funky voltages when I measured those, and I put them up here. I put questions marks on them because I'm not sure why those voltages are there, and I'm going to have to do a little more investigation in it. But if you're into that kind of stuff, there's the diagram, and you can figure out exactly what those voltages are. All right, the last thing I wanted to talk about was the hinges. I got a lot of questions about the hinges, and everything on this drone is new. Everything in the airframe is new. The hinges are new. And the hinges are interesting because I worry that when I look at single points of failure, obviously the blades are a problem, the battery's a problem. These hinges are a problem. For me, if these hinges get sloppy and start flapping around, um, even though people have discussed this on my, on my channel and said, no, Rick, you're wrong, the centrifugal force of the blades will actually pull them out into the home position, that may be true, but I'm worried that I'm not going to be flying perfectly level at a constant velocity. I'm going to be banking, I'm going to be turning, and i got to believe when I bank, the aerodynamics are going to change on that, and they may flip back in. So these hinges are super critical that that spring inside there keeps these in a the fully extended position. Now, I did a little investigation. I didn't have the guts to actually pull the springs out. I may do that yet. But if you look on the front, these two front ones have cover plates there. You can pull the cover plate off, and I've got a diagram of what it looks like underneath. What you're looking at there is one end of that spring. Now, inside that, that cylinder is really just a cylinder coil of spring that's under tension. And there are two home positions. There's a home position fully extended, and there's another position here where it's relaxed when it's fully closed. That spring um, has got a tremendous amount of tension on it. It is replaceable, but again, it looks like a pretty major undertaking to change it. So I'm going to have to keep track of how well this stays fully extended. If it starts getting sloppy, I'll let you know about that. And I'm kind of keeping track roughly of how many times I've used the drone, how many times I've opened it up. But I will tell you that I found it interesting, and I found a diagram, an actual x-ray diagram of that spring on the internet. DJI has a ton of patents on this spring mechanism alone, and what they're, what they're claiming, and I believe them to be true, is that the spring not only does a real good job of keeping these arms out, but it also acts as a damper, like a shock absorber, because they realized as you fly this drone, these arms are going to be vibrating. So if they transfer that vibration to the drone, it's going to be really difficult to keep the camera steady and keep the GPS positioning steady. So the springs serve a dual purpose. They're not only there to keep the arms fully extended, they're also there to act as a damper between those arms and the main body of the copter. So again, every step of the way, I'm finding stuff that I'm like, holy smokes, that's so cool. So they did a real good job with the development of this. So that's all I really wanted to get into this clip. I don't like to make these too long because I think I bore you guys if I go on too much about the technology. but. I'm trying to prove the case that you know I believe this to be a phenomenally functional and long-lasting drone, and I really feel like DJI, DJI has done a tremendous job of engineering around building this thing and putting together a way better product than I really expected it to be, honestly, when I started tearing it open. I would have forgiven a lot of mistakes inside the drone and a lot of sloppiness in there. I didn't find any of it. So what that tells me is that, and I don't know if DJI will ever see this clip, but somewhere in that large corporation, there's a design team that I believe is communicating with aliens because they've really built this thing to be incredibly cool in first generation product, which is, just doesn't happen. Think, think six or seven generations of iPhone to get to the point where they are today. This is their first generation and it's really a second or third generation product from, from a development perspective and I've got a lot of experience with that. So anyway, that's enough for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. If I miss something you want me to cover a little bit deeper, just drop me a comment below. Uh, as always, I appreciate the subscribers. Our subscribers have been growing every week, which is really encouraging to me and it inspires me to do more of these clips. So as long as you guys enjoy watching these, I'll keep doing them. Um, thanks again for everything and comments are important um, and subscribers are important, so do that. Thanks an awful lot for watching. Have a great afternoon and happy droning. Mm -hmm.